Greetings, dear friends. What a joy it is to gather together again. We're a gathering, you know. One of our favorite verses in the Christ Life Fellowship is Ephesians 1 and 10 that says that the Lord in the fullness of the dispensation of times will gather all things together in Christ unto himself. And that's exactly what it is we like to consider ourselves a part of. We know God has many children that are part of that great in-gathering, so to speak. But our little get-togethers with you here on video and wherever we join with people of Christ life knowledge, it's a gathering. It's a gathering we feel brought by the Lord. We do very little to promote and organize and uh, uh, bring about by our own effort what it is the Lord is doing. And I hope you understand that, that unless the Lord is with us, and working through us and working as us, what we do won't really profit the Father. We see so much today in religion that hasn't been a profit to the Father, though there have been great results and by secularism, huge success. But the simple facts are the Father is the one that's preparing the way and doing the work and what needs to be done in our world today. And I'd like for you to have a grasp for that because sometimes we get overwhelmed and just overtaken by the idealism that we've got to have great big things in order for it to be God. Jesus himself in his most notorious acts on this earth, his most important acts on this earth and his, his most uh, devastating acts to sin and Satan was done almost alone as even the Father himself, so to speak, left him alone. He didn't have big things, and he didn't have the outward sign of success, but of course he set us free by this consternation that life comes out of death. Well, we're glad that you joined with us today, and we're going to begin right off by talking to you about uh, some of the blessed things that the Spirit has prepared for us in this glorious message. We still are operating on the theme from 1 John, 1st chapter, around the 5th verse, where he says, this then is the message, the message, which we have heard of him. And as we have stipulated many times before, the message means a specific message, and we believe there is a specific message for the church today. Now, we're not saying by that that we're the only ones that have that message, far from it. It's, it's not our thing at all. It's not something that came by dream, vision, or special word from the Lord to me or anybody else. Uh, the message is what God brings <coughs> by the Holy Spirit to every hungry heart worldwide. And I'd like to tell you that all over this earth, God is moving with this message. A message that heretofore has not been preached and not even known by most believers, and yet it's the clearest cut truth in the Word of God. Now, doesn't that seem a little strange? There's so much about God we don't know, and that's where we're going to begin today in our study. In fact, there are four things that are highly pertinent to us in our growth and, and knowledge of the things of the Lord, and I want to give these things to you, if I might, right now. In fact, there are four persons that the believer must come to know intimately. Some of these he will know uh, subconsciously. But there are four persons we must come to know that we don't know in our innate form as human beings. Uh, of course, the first of these that we must come to know is God himself, God, God the Father. We must come to know God the Father in a, in a very uh, specific and personal way. The other person that we don't really know is God the Son. The other person we don't know is the deity. Well, got that wrong there. The deity, Satan. And then the last person we don't know is our human self. Now, I want to take just a moment to try to define what it is we have put here. 
We don't really know God. We, we, we know all about God, but we don't know God the Father. We will study adoption a little bit further down the line. But adoption is a process whereby a birth son who in his birthing got new spirit, new nature, but no new body or new mind must be brought into the understanding of his new family. He's a whole new race of people and he must be indoctrinated, trained, oriented to that new thing that has happened to him. So the process of adoption is that process whereby one who is already birthed by God comes to the knowledge and the understanding of who and what he is by God. Consequently, we come to know our Father in the process of adoption. Knowing him as a son, as Paul says in two places, Romans 8 and Galatians 4, that at some point in our Christian experience, by this knowing of God the Father, we cry, Abba Father, or my Father, my Father, my Father, with an understanding that we are no longer outside the family, but in the family by an innate relative relationship, a blood relationship by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the life of Christ in us, by the nature of God in us, and by the seed of God Christ in us. These are the things that help us to know our Father. Most believers live a lifetime and never come to have the rest and the peace that belongs to every born-again believer by a father-son relationship. Now, so much has been done in the name of sonship that many people are uh, immediately uh, drawn away from the very idea because everything from the Elks and Moose Lodges and Masons and everybody else call themselves sons of God in some form or another. And so the idea of sonship, which has been highly perverted in Christian circles and cults, is sort of strange to people. But the simple facts are we become as sons to a father in the process of our growth. Now, some people in the past have called that the process of sanctification. I draw away from that, even though there are some scriptures that might uh, say that, because Christ has been made unto us sanctification, 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, and as a result of that, sanctification is not something that is coming to us or that we're growing into. It is something we already have by Christ in us, and by knowledge, we're learning it. We must make a keen distinction in our Christian walk between what it is the believer has and what he learns. In Christianity, in particular in religion, uh, what it is we don't know we claim is something we don't have. And that's not so. Since you've been born again, everything Jesus is, you are. As he was in this world, so are we. Uh, you lack for nothing. You come behind in no spiritual gift or virtue of God. Your problem is you don't know that. So adoption literally is the process whereby a believer comes to know God as his father. That's basically what adoption is. It's coming to this knowledge of who and what you are by Christ in you. Uh, we'll get back to the subject of who God is in just a few moments. But then we want to look at the next person we don't really know, and that's God the Son. Now, we've tried to make it clear in all of these lessons of the tremendous distinction between knowing about Jesus and knowing Christ as our life. I know a lot of people are offended by things that I say often, and I wish that I had opportunity to lay a better foundation for some of the things that I say because the Spirit is just uh, unloading, as it were, on me so many powerful truths that uh, flow out of the Christ life that sometimes I don't lay a proper foundation for what it is I'm saying, but there is a foundation, I believe, for most everything I say. And one of the things is we know so much about Jesus, it has confused us to knowing where he is and who he is by us. Let's look at these two ideas. First, we don't know where Jesus is. Most people go to church to find Jesus. Most people call a preacher to lay hands on them to feel Jesus. Some people read a book or listen to a tape 
or maybe go to the Holy Land to have an affinity with Jesus. Now that's Jesus of Nazareth they're looking for, and Paul specifically says there is no Jesus of Nazareth to be known. Now see, this kind of hard on people. Uh, most people say, oh, Jesus became so real to me when I went to the Holy Land. That's Jesus of Nazareth they're seeing, and it is a further separation to them in their mind of who and what they are by Christ. Because that Jesus there who may become very real and precious to you emotionally is outward. And of course your emotions are an outward thing. You, not inward. The inward man at all is not uh, growing by these outer things. He grows only by the Word of God. Uh, the Jesus that is in you is where the real Jesus is. Now see, that's kind of hard for us to take. Uh, somebody said to me not long ago, well, if Jesus is in me, then why would I need anybody else? You don't need anybody else. You stand alone before God. You see, it's religion that says you need the church, you need the ministry, you need the program, uh, you need the association of other saints. But do you understand that when you stand before God, none of these things will matter. When you face your last moment, if you're in your right mind, none of those things will matter. So really, it doesn't matter about all of these outer things, as important they are, and I certainly wouldn't uh, attempt in the slightest way to demoralize the church or, or the program of God in, a, in an outer form, but none of those things really matter when it comes to knowing Christ and knowing where he is. You're going to have to, at some time in your walk with God, if you grow in grace, come to see that you, by Christ in you alone, stands before God. Just you and him. A union of the two of you makes you stand before God with the peace and rest God intended that human beings have on this earth. So we've got to know where Jesus is. Where is he? It's Christ in us. That's where he is. Uh, I can join with you and take you by the hand or lay hands on you and you can feel something, but it's in your outer uh, man, it's in your soulish area, in your heart. That's soulish. Uh, emotions, will, uh, intellect, all of that's uh, very important, but it's in your soulish area and not of spirit at all. Though we have great feeling for it, it's still not of spirit. Now see, that, that kind of hurts us because we've got it all mixed up. Only the Word of God can separate soul and spirit, and that's so important that we are knowers and not feelers of Christ. Because Christ is in me, that's something I know. Because the Bible is more explicit concerning that knowing than anything else. Now that's the real key in this subject, becoming as knowers. We'll talk about this more later on. But we are knowers when it comes to the Christ life. What do I know? I know Christ is in me. Number one message in the Bible, most often singly stated doctrine in the Bible, Christ in me, my hope of glory. So we become knowers of that great truth. Now you can live a lifetime and hear every gospel that man can bring and maybe not become a knower of where Jesus is. Christ is in you. Well, what is church then? If we don't go to church to meet and see Jesus, then what is church? Church is the amalgamation of the saints put together that they might grow in grace and that they might effectively spread the gospel. But that's the outer church. Where's the real inner church meeting? If two or three, Jesus says, gather in my name, then am I in their midst. Or as the Greek says, then do you constitute me. Where's the real Christ? It's when two or three believers get together. That forms the real church, the, the real outer church. Where is Jesus then? He's in the believer. He's in the believer. That's where he is. But then the other point is, who are you by that Christ? Well, you are that Christ in your human form. Now, I didn't say you were Jesus Christ. We can't ever be Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. But I am that Christ in my human form because his life is the only life that I have. Now, if we're going to come to know Jesus, we've got to know where he is and we've got to know who we are by him. Knowing. 
That's the key word the Apostle Paul uses again and again, knowing something, not just feeling something. It's not just in the soulish area of emotion or heart. It's in the mind area where we really know who we are by the Holy Spirit. The other person we don't know is Satan. There's so many things I could say about Satan and demons and satanic warfare. And there's so many people that are taken up with this. That's uh, Satan's promotion. Christian people, good, well-meaning Christian people that are so involved in uh, Satanism and fighting the devil and fighting demons and in deliverance ministries have literally become tools of Satan. Nothing he likes better than all that publicity. He is originally a created deity. Now, I'm not for sure what all that means, but God allowed him in the plan to become the death life of those who disobeyed God. In other words, every sinner has as his only life Satan in him because Satan has birthed him by the sinner's unbelief. Unbelief. That's what it is that is most important in God's plan. In my devotions this morning, I was m meditating on these verses of Scripture uh, out of John's Gospel and uh, where he says that men are not condemned because they are sinners. They are condemned because they have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said that he had not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Now, you see, this is highly powerful and contrary to what it is we're doing in religion today. In fact, uh, in religion today, we are so quick to condemn Satan and to fight Satan that we miss the point of what's wrong with sinners. I think we even miss the point of people who are sick and many uh, Christians who are sick are oppressed by Satan and have demon powers working in their life. And certainly demon powers need to be attacked when we so feel led and discern it. But dear friends, most of Christian program having to do with Satan is doing nothing but giving him publicity. The more you see Satan, the less you see God. The more you see Satan in the sinner, the less you see God's plan. Because the sinner is not sinners because of Satan. They are sinners because they've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So how did we get this deity in us that became our very nature? Because human beings must be possessed of a deity. That's the way God made us. And when Adam and Eve believed what the devil said in the Garden of Eden, they became sinners was Satan's nature in them. And so John says, from then on, human beings did the works of Satan. They didn't do their own works. They did the works of Satan. Why? He was their life. He was their nature. That's why you must be born again. But my point is, believing. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we exchange. We've had a radical exchange to take place because of the cross of Jesus Christ and his death on that cross from Satan to Christ. Satan out, Christ in. Now, that's what we don't really know about Satan. It's so easy to fight him in an outer way that we forget that sinners are bound by Satan, who is their father, a father who has birthed them. He has literally birthed them. But they're not sinners because Satan has birthed them. God has made provision. The cross has opened up the great uh, uh, door of God's grace and provision so that whosoever believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ is taken from Satan life to the Christ life. Gloriously, the cross has made this provision. But you see, we need to see Satan in a different light. Deity Satan. That doesn't mean that he is uh, equal to God, but he is the God of this world, the scripture says. He is the God of sinners. Now, see, sinners don't know that. And it isn't our mission to go through uh, life and preach the gospel that all Satan, uh, all uh, sinners are Satan people and that Satan, their father, has birthed them. That wouldn't do any good. What we do is preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and whosoever believeth that gospel has an unbelievable power to take place in their life where Satan is put out as a deity and Christ as life 
comes into them by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Adam and Eve believed what Satan said in the Garden of Eden and took on Satan's nature. Calvary is an exchange of natures. It's not just sin out and salvation in. Salvation's a person. Sin is a person. John said that Satan was the sinner from the very beginning. So we need to come to know Satan. What is it we know most about Satan? We know most that those that have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ are condemned because they did not believe, not because they are Satan. Satan persons are Satan uh, children, so to speak. Uh, remember, Paul uses the language of, of a father birthing uh, sons when it comes to Satan, too, because he says we're children of sin, we're children of wrath, we're children of the unrighteous one, we're children of this world. So there was no pretense in the New Testament that sinners were birthed by Satan and Satan was their nature and that nature could only be put out by one bearing sin in his very body and dying with it, putting an end to it so that whosoever believeth would be saved, gloriously saved. We will spend a lot of time in our study talking about the human self. But because we don't know God is our Father and God the Son is our life and that Satan has been put out and can no longer operate through us, because we don't know that, we consequently don't know who we are. We don't know who our human self is. And we hope to spend a considerable amount of time dealing with what is the human self, the, the human being. Now you'll notice and I trust I'm consistent on this, but you'll notice in everything I say that I never use the term human nature. There is no such thing as human nature. Now, there was a sin nature when we were unconverted. That was Satan. At that time, we had the sin nature. We had no human nature because Satan was the sinner. You see, religion has bogged us down again with a lot of untruth. And it is said, well, you got a human nature, you got a Satan nature, you got a God nature. No such thing. Bible never speaks of any such thing. So when you were a sinner, you had the sin nature, and it took Calvary to put that out. When you became born again, you had God nature in you, partakers of divine nature, Christ the seed in you, growing up as you. And when that took place, when Christ became your very life, then... His nature began to flow out of you. His fruit of His Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, and all such as, begin to flow out of you. The fruit of Christ. You begin to bear His fruit because you had a union or marriage with Him. Now, when His fruit began to flow out of you, that was your true self. God needs the human self in order to express himself. So there never has been a human nature separate from a sin nature or Satan nature and from a God nature. Never has been. So when you were converted, when you were born again, yourself, which had expressed Satan, now made a radical change to express Christ because you had Satan life previous. Now you have the Christ life by Calvary. This is what you need to know. This is what you need to know about yourself. You see, if you don't ever come to know that, you can never be what God intended that you be. And I don't mean to be harsh or, or too far out on that subject. But you see, I don't think the average believer of the Lord Jesus Christ has ever come to know who he is. Who are you? Did you ever ask the question, who am I? Who am I? You are a nature of a deity. That's what you are. You never have been a self under self. Nowhere does the Bible ever speak of you being a self under self. That's why we are rebirth. That's why the, Jesus came saying you must be born again because there has to be a radical birthing to take place. You just don't uh, make up your mind, well, I sin, now I quit sinning. You don't do that. There has to be a rebirth. There has to be an exchange of natures. There has to be Satan out and Christ in. You can't by any stretch of the imagination 
Make yourself better by yourself. If you do, you're not acceptable to God because he only accepts his seed in his children for that was his purpose from the beginning. So we're coming to know who we are as selves. Well, this brings us now to a greater understanding of God or hopefully a greater understanding of God. Since there are four persons we must come to know in our work with God, God the Father, God the Son, and Satan and our human self, in order that we might fulfill God's plan and purpose and, and actually come to his ultimate intention, it's important that we have some feeling about God himself. Uh, who is God? What, what is God? Well, the technical term I'd use for who and what God is, is the term sovereign. Now, I know that word's not used too much. Uh, maybe preachers throw the term around once in a while, but the, the term that we want to use most is the term sovereign. Sovereign, what does that mean? That means a total person, a total self, a total being unto himself. What about God? Is he real? Is there really such thing as God? Islam says there's God. Buddhist says there's a God. Shintoism says there's a God. Christian scientism says there's a God. Uh, none of these do we as Christians agree with in doctrine or ideas. Who is God then? Is God real? Have you ever come to a place in your walk where God is so real to you? I don't mean in an outer farm where you get with a great crowd and there's a big orchestra and a thrilling choir singing or a preacher that's driving home points and you get goosebumps all over you. That's outer. Uh, that's not the way you come to know God because in your most uh, stressful points in life, you're not going to have those feelings at all. When, when you're down and out and you're, you're really bound by circumstances and situations. You're not going to have any of these outer feelings. And so, are you going to know God? Do you know who he is? Well, I believe God is a person. Our general statement in the Trinity is that it's God in three persons. We'll study the Trinity a little later. God is real. God is a person. God is sovereign. What do I mean by sovereign? I mean by sovereign that he is a total person within himself. God is a total person within himself. Now, maybe you don't understand that. So this is what it is. I believe God has all of the personality traits and ideas that are connected with human beings. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean God has arms. He has hands. He has eyes. He has ears. He has a face. He has a body. Oh, some people say, no, God is spirit. Jesus said, God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. In that vernacular, he was spirit of worship. But he's a real person. I believe I'll see God one day. I believe I'll see a literal person like unto human beings. Perfect in every respect, while human beings may not be. But I'll see God as a distinctive person. Because the scripture gives us innumerable accounts that that he sees, he hears, he walks, he even eats in one place, and one place it says he never sleeps, another place says he does sleep, all in different vernacular, not contradictory at all. But God is real. He says things. People hear him. So we have to take a look at God in this light. Uh, how do we come to know this God? Well, there are numerous ways. For instance, uh, we come to know God by the fact that he is sovereign. How does that fit into our daily life? It means this. Sooner or later, you have a test or trial or a problem in life whereby uh, you have to admit to God's sovereignty. Uh, let's say you become sick and the doctor says you may have cancer. And so the first thing a believer would do would be to trust God. We'll ask God to help us. We'll, we'll get to where somebody prays the prayer of faith or somebody we have confidence in, we'll get to them 
that they may minister to us and the uh, the time goes along, we're prayed for once, twice, several times, uh, the, the cancer grows, we're getting worse, uh, uh, doctors are confirming us with chemotherapy or, uh, or radium or uh, radical surgery or something, and uh, it, just, it just gets worse, and for some reason, God has not given us the miracle, and yet everybody we're talking to says God heals, God is able, God won't fail, and so forth, uh, but we sense that we're getting worse and worse. Now, if you are a believer and your whole intention is to be a child of God, you will not allow this outer thing that's taking place in your body to destroy who you are in Christ. Because you see, the outer body is not to be saved. It's not regenerated. We get a new body on the resurrection morning, so there's no regeneration of this body. And so at a certain point, when it's inevitable to doctors, friends, loved ones, and even yourself, that you're going to die. What do you do if you're a true believer? I mean, if you really love God and know God and are living for God, what do you do? What you do at that time is acquiesce to the truth that God is sovereign. What do you do? You simply say, God, this must be what you want. This must be what you want to do with me. This must be the way you want me to go. You trust him. You don't trust him now to get you out of the circumstance as much as you trust him in the circumstance that he knows what is best. That's sovereignty. I see that's hard for us to take. But if we don't have a little understanding of it along the way, we could come down to that last breath and like uh, some in the scripture will curse God and die. I've known uh, seeming believers to do that. I, I don't know how much a believer they were, but I know those who have done that, and that's very sad. They don't know who they are, and uh, maybe God by His grace saves them anyhow. But you see, that's what sovereignty is. God is sovereign. Maybe you ask God to give you something. Maybe you're in business and you need a miracle, and so you desperately trusted God, and you read the books, and you plucked precious promises, and you have... Uh, going everywhere, there's positive thinking, and you really believe in God for a miracle, and, and then you don't get it. What do you do then? You acquiesce us to his sovereignty. Not my will, but thine be done. Even Jesus ultimately came to that state in his relationship with the Father, and so shall you. Now that's love. That's trust. That's a deeper understanding of who God is. And you must come to it sooner or later if you're ever to know who you are. Because it's in knowing who you are that you really do express the God that's all about you. You come to know God by the way he displays his personality. You can preach a God, and I did it. At one phase of my life, at one stage of my understanding, I preached God could do anything, and he will do anything if you trust him, and if you don't get everything from God you're trusting him for it's because you've got sin or unbelief in your life. You either don't have faith or you've got sin in your life so God isn't going to get you. What a foolish position that was. But I had to go through that, you see, and I see uh, great numbers today that are at that stage. Uh, I had to learn God's personality. I had God fixed up to where he was my God by my understanding. We call that the epitome of our own idealism. In other words, we've all made our own God. That's right, we've made our own God. In doing that, we have decided that God is like this because this is the way I see him. We won't let him be sovereign. We won't let him be a person. Uh, we let him be doctrinaire, denominational, uh, uh, according to our ethical stand or our ethnic stand or our nationality. We let God be who we think he is. And consequently, he's not quite like that because we never got to know him. Uh, he displays his personality. One of God's great personality traits is displayed in creation. Let's take a simple thing like a beautiful day. Have you ever noticed how human beings are when there's a beautiful day? Everybody comments about, oh, isn't this a pretty day? Isn't it beautiful? Just look out there. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't life great? God sure made a beautiful day. But what do we do on bad days? I mean, when it's icy, rainy, stormy, wind blowing hard, nobody can get out, kids can't play, uh, 
the house is overrun with people and uh, cars won't start and, and maybe it's so cold you have to go out and feed the cows or, or go to work in the storm or, and you say, oh, what an awful day this is. What an awful day this is. Do you realize if it was God's personality depicted in the beautiful day, whose personality is in the bad day? Oh, you say this must be a satanic day. How foolish that is. Satan doesn't run the weather. Satan doesn't run the universe. Satan's not in charge of creation. My father is. He has everything working just perfect. So they're going to be good days and bad days. We see God's personality coming through to this. What do we do? We love him. In, in whatever state we're in, we love him. In whatever circumstance there is, we love him and trust him. Because all creation displays his uh, personality and his character. His character. You're not going to like this about God, but there are things in God's character that's a bit hard to take, and we're going we're to study some of these things. Well, what does he do by creation? We have good and bad in creation, in, in nature, uh, like good days and stormy days. Uh, what is God's intention by that? His whole intention in the creation of the world was to make sons. Make sons. He could have brought us on up to his house like he did Lucifer, but the past plan proved that that's not a good idea because Lucifer living in the father's house turned against him, rebelled against him, and the end result was God didn't get what he wanted. He wanted a son. He didn't get it out of Lucifer, so in his next plan he set aside a place called earth where he would train these sons. So the world is nothing but a schoolhouse, you see, for the sons of God. And his whole intention by nature and creation is to make these sons. In fact, uh, uh, I want you to go with me to Ephesians, the first chapter. Uh, we just can't spend enough time in this first chapter of Ephesians because, as I told you before, it's the greatest document I know in the whole of the Scriptures. If I was to make one portion of Scripture greater than another, I'd have to say that Ephesians 1 is the furthest reaching truth in the whole of the Scriptures. But I want to, I want to read uh, a couple of verses out of Ephesians 1. First verse 5, having predestinated us by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now we'll study uh, uh, predestination and we've talked a little bit about adoption. Actually that scripture reads, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We talked a little bit about adoption in this session, but what I want you to see is the last line of that fifth verse, according to the good pleasure of his will. What is it God's doing with the making of sons? That's what adoption is. It's the making of sons. Sons are already birthed, but they're not made into sons by knowledge, except by the processes that go on on this earth through circumstances and situations. What does God say about this? Paul said that that was according to the good pleasure of his will. Well, now that's something we don't have a lot of teaching for, is it? In fact, until we get in trouble, we don't see the sovereignty of God. We don't see that God is ruler, God is Lord. Uh, we see him only as Lord as long as he's doing what we claim the scripture says he ought to do. And if something's happening to us that we didn't find scripture for that was good, then it wasn't the Lord at all. Got to be careful about that because he is sovereign. God gets good pleasure out of his children. And I've always said to uh, concerning this verse that God gets a kick out of seeing what happens to his children because nothing happens to them that's not his will and for his glory. Now see, that's pretty hard to take because you've got the problem with the devil. I don't have that problem with the devil because I don't give him publicity in my life. I have bad things to happen, but I see God working in them. I see God working through them and I soon move past them by his grace and just like Jesus was on this earth, I passed through the good, I pass through the bad, but in the end, my Father is the one who is most glorified. So this verse says that the purpose of God is that he gets pleasure out of us conforming to his will. Another verse in this first chapter uh, says uh, nearly the same thing. Verse 9, 
You need to mark verse 5 and verse 9, especially the line in there that deals with what we're talking about right now. Verse 9 says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, see, that's kind of hard for us to take. Uh, what we want is a denomination, a doctrine, a catechism that says this is God all fixed up in a neat package. Uh, if you really got faith, God is good and God will always be good to you. Well, that's baloney. That's human teaching. The facts are it's not always good for us and wasn't intended to be good for us because he intended to make sons while we were on this earth. We weren't made for this earth. We were made to be trained on this earth to live in the Father's house. Uh, we weren't trained for living on this earth any more than the prodigal son was trained to live in a hog pen. But the hog pen was his training grounds to live in his father's house. That's the way this world is. And sometimes we look at this world and it is a hog pen. Sometimes we look at this world and it's a riotous place to live, as it was said of the prodigal son. Uh, a riotous living. Uh, we see it's a good place at times where we spend our inheritance and have a ball out of life. But mostly, the world is a training ground for sons of God. So, uh, God gets pleasure out of the making of his sons. And that's why I ask you to mark these two verses in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 9. Because he gets pleasure according to his will. But in this ninth verse, there's something very important that says, uh, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. In himself. Now, this is a far-reaching consequence, but I have his nature in me. Now, if I get that fixed in my mind and read this verse that everything that happens to me is according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. I'm not a God. Believers are not gods, but we have God nature in us, partakers of divine nature. And this idea that God has purposed in himself certain things for our good and his glory, Romans 8 and 28, certain things for our good and his glory is compatible to the nature that is in us. What does that mean? That means that a believer should never quibble over the circumstance and situation because they're going to be there for everybody. Everybody's got around the next bend in life something. Sometimes it's hurtful, sometimes it's good. Not all circumstances and situations are bad for us. Some of them are good for us. All of them ultimately are good for us. But I think our reasoning by modern religion is that if it's a bad circumstance, it's the devil. And so we have it fixed in our mind, the good is God, the bad is Satan. And of course that isn't so. If you live like that, you'll never have what he purposed in himself. You see, I'm a Christ self. That same nature is in me that was in God. And if God purposed that certain things would be for his pleasure, even when they were not the best of things, the good things for us, then I have compatibility with it. Now, Paul came to that understanding better than anybody in the scriptures. He was able to say, it doesn't matter whether I live or die, I'm in Christ. Isn't that precious? You see, we become an outer people where God has to do the outer things because it has uh, blessings to our flesh. And it sort of reasons with our natural mind that we want everything good, that we forget who and what we are by the Christ that's in us. That's the purpose of these lessons. That's why it is God is sending a new and fresh and vibrant move of the Spirit to this world. It's because he's raising up a people who now see that according to his pleasure, he's governing our circumstances and situations. And since he has purposed this in himself and has given to us the very nature of himself, we're able to overcome all things. We can overcome all things by Christ who is in us, praise God. Well, God's ultimate intention for human beings is that he might have sons like unto his only begotten son. Sometimes we read John 3, 16 and think that this is Jesus doing it for us. But it's really deeper than that. God wants his birth children to be as the seed he puts in them, Christ in them, their hope of glory. 
That's what he wants. He wants us to be as the seed, Christ in us, our hope of glory. That's why Jesus said in John 3.16 that God so loved the sinner that he gave his only begotten son, a giver. God's a giver. What did he give? Salvation? No, not salvation separate from Christ. It says he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not go to hell but have everlasting life. Now you see what he gave? He gave Jesus. That's what God gave. Gave him to be me in sin. Gave him to be me as a son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why does it say only begotten son? Because it's the only begotten son that is God's seed. That's God's seed put in every one of us when we were born again. So the only intention of God is to have sons likened to the only begotten son. Now there are numerous references like in the scripture references to we being as the only begotten son. I am not the only begotten son, but I am as him to God because that's the seed that's in me. That's why a couple of times Paul mentions the church of the first fruit or that we are the first fruits of him who has died. What do you mean by first fruits? That means that we are the same as the only begotten son. We're not the only begotten son, I restress, but we're the same as him to the father. Why? We have the same seed in us that is Christ. It is not something like Jesus in us. It is Christ in us. Bible never says that he has made us Christ-like or that he has put within us a seed almost like Jesus or something like Jesus or trying to be like Jesus. We have Christ in us, distinctive Christ in us, only begotten son, making us first fruit son. We are the church of the firstborn. What does that mean? That means that we're not only first fruits, we're firstborn. We, every single one of us in the body of Christ, are firstborn sons. Why? God's whole intention was to make us likened unto his only begotten son. You had to understand that, friends. That's his intention. His intention is not to make this world better. I see so many of my friends today who are bent on what we call the kingdom message, trying to make this world better. They have an idea that the Christians are going to become spiritual Jews and that the four covenants belonging to Israel are going to be turned over to the church of Jesus Christ because we're now spiritual Jews and we're going to rule and reign on this earth and put our foot on Satan's neck and all this sort of thing. That never was God's intention. I don't mean to make light of it, but that was never God's intention. His intention was to get sons. His intention wasn't for this whole world. If his intention was for this world, he'd have made it different in the first place. He made it exactly like he wanted it to train sons. Now, the church of Jesus Christ is never to take the place of Christ. The church is not triumphant. It's Christ that's triumphant. The church is only triumphant because Christ is in it. Do you understand that? It is not believers who are to triumph over the world and to rule over the world. It is Christ in them that does that. It's not the believer that's becoming better. It's Christ who's perfect in the believer. We've got the gospel all mixed up. And so multitudes of people are being swayed today by the idealism that we're going to make this world better, that it's just going to get better and better. And I heard a preacher say the other day, it won't be long before we'll walk into a hospital and heal everybody sick. That isn't necessary. The healing of the body is, is, is not the criterion of God. Uh, Jesus in his last year healed very few people and saw that he could do very little good in that area. That wasn't the intention of God that he just healed people and set them free. And God knows I believe in healing. I spent more years in the healing ministry uh, than most who are preaching healing today, and, and I believe in it and practice it. But that's not the criterion of God. The criterion of God is the making of sons. And he's making sons like and under the only begotten son. And we must not become trapped by what's going on all around us by those who don't see what it is God is really doing, nor hear what it is God is saying. And I'm not saying that we're elite and we're special, far from it. I'm just growing in grace, but I'm hearing what God says. The troubles and trials that come to us in life have a very distinctive purpose. They separate us from the crowd, from the multitudes, from those who have never had to stand alone so that we can stand alone. I sense in my life, that God's let me go through a couple of deep hells. I mean, where I really suffered and hurt, I thought I did. I mean, I was 
dressed to the breaking point. I would have given up had it not been for God's grace. I would have taken my life at a point, even as a preacher, if it hadn't been for God's grace. I was sustained by the Christ in me, but I was ready to quit and give up. Sometimes I think about that, and I may have other periods like that ahead. I don't know. Hope not. But I think about this, and I wonder, why did God let these awful circumstances and situations come my way? Now I know. It helped me in standing alone, knowing Christ in me as my victor, to be able to say what it is God wanted said. For Moses to be able to bring to the children of Israel what God wanted said in his day, God led him from the backside of the desert. I mean, he trained and taught him there. Uh, the, the most important message ever preached in the New Testament was by John the Baptist in his one-line sermon when he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And he was trained for uh, perhaps 30 years in the desert, eating locusts and wild honey and, and being uh, provided for by the very animals, as it were to preach that one-line message of introducing Jesus to this world, not as a Lord, not as King, not as conqueror, but as a Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Because when Jesus finally came, they, they could only see kingship and lordship in him, and that's sort of the way the church is today. They don't see the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And John was trained to, by standing alone on the backside of the desert to come to that tremendous uh, message. And I see in my own life that God let me stand alone sometimes where I didn't think life was worth living, where it, it, well, it was bad. But now as I look back on it, God separated me from the multitude. He separated me from religion. He separated me from denominationalism. Not that that's bad. Denominationalism, not a bad word, it means one of a kind, and I'm still one of a kind, so in a sense I'm denominational. But he separated me from man-made doctrine and said, Litzman, I'm going to give you a message and I want you to preach it. And you may have to stand alone, but you know how to do that now. You've been trained to do that, so do it. I'm the first fruits of God. I'm his direct son by Christ in me, the only begotten. I'm not a secondary son. I'm not a nephew of God. God has no grandsons. He only has firstborn sons. And I'm a part of that firstborn church as every born-again believer is, whether they know it or not. But I know it. And my message to this world is to tell them who they are by Christ in them. I stand alone many times. Thank God this move of the Spirit is worldwide. When we first started back years ago preaching Christ, there wasn't very many that wanted to hear about Christ. They wanted to hear about what he could do. They didn't want to know him. They wanted to know his works, his gifts, his his graces. But as time has gone by, the Lord has swelled this body. It's growing. It's not anything I've had to do with, as I said, coming to you today. It's God's doing. He raises up people in Africa. I hear from people in Africa. I hear from people in the Philippine Islands. I hear from people even in China. I hear from people around the world where they say, God is showing us these truths. Those are people that's had to stand alone. They've had to walk alone in their trials and hardships, in their circumstances and situations. They have been pushed to where it was nobody but them and God. When you get to that place, out of the masses, out of the doctrine, out of the church program, out of religion, when you get to that place out of the outer world and you're shut in with God, then you hear what he's saying. Then you'll say what he's saying. And you'll say it boldly as we want to. We'll make it known to the ends of the earth as we desire to. You see, it's his message. That's why John said, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. Do you have a feeling for what it is God's doing? Has it ever gripped you that God is doing a tremendous thing over the face of the earth today and I'm a part of it? Well, you have to stand alone to know that. I mean, you have to shut off everything else. That's why we're coming to you where you are right now, that by this message, God might raise up a people who are seeing and hearing what it is he's doing in the world today. I cry for your help. I don't want you to do anything that the Christ in you doesn't want to do. I don't want you to do anything in self-effort. But if there is a yearning from the Christ in you to spread his gospel and to let his message be known, do what you can to stand with us. 
encourage us by praying for us and helping us. Your finances help. Your offering helps. The taking of our literature, getting our number one missionary out, like Life of the Sun, getting it out to people. Be sure you have a quantity of the magazines on hand. We have thousands of back issues. We'd like to get them into your hands. Get them to people, even though they're back issues. They have the message in it. Uh, to the sick and suffering, we have the tools of the healing booklets. Get one of these healing booklets into the hands of people that are sick and suffering, tormented by Satan. This book will help them. If you know somebody that's unsaved, but really is fed up with churchanity and religion, this is a book that'll help them. Nicodemus and the birthing. That's, that's a book that'll bless them. And then uh, don't forget our message book. This, this is the book that has the seven points of the Christ life message in it. Honestly, there are a lot more points, but this brings the seven basic points of the Christ life uh, to your heart. And then our last published book uh, is Jesus Lost in the Church. Jesus Lost in the Church is a powerful book for the hungry heart, how you can go on with God. You can help me spread the gospel. You can help get this message to the ends of the earth. We need your help. I'm not crying for you to send us an offering or we're not going to be on the air. That's not our way. We don't raise or pledge money at all in the Christ Life Fellowship. We trust God and God meets our need. But if you have a cry within you to do something for God, if the Christ within you is rising up and saying, let's get this truth out, let's get this message to the ends of the earth, then stand with us and help us. You'll be standing with hundreds of groups just like yours who are catching the vision that men are only going to be happy and set free when they see Christ as their all and in all. Thank you for listening to us today. Remember, if you've got any need, seeing more of Jesus is really what meets that need. The person next to you has Christ in them. Take them by the hand before you leave this session and say, I see Jesus in you. Maybe you'd like to sing that little song as we do in many of our sessions, but most of all, you can only see Christ in them as you see Christ in yourself.